From ancient times, humanity regarded war as the quintessence of cruelty and death, a merciless time that begins at someone's will and ends when one side becomes unable to continue. Vacillations in war are akin to death, and thus, in conditions of perpetual killing, there remains only action, swift execution of orders and a complete absence of any contemplation. War is the days when, to survive, one must cast aside such useless qualities as humanity and compassion, assuming that they are only acceptable to display in times of peace. However, among the defenders of humanity emerged one who knew that inaction in the cause of mercy is a crime surpassing even murder, and war is a period during which it is especially important for the strongest to show compassion to the defenseless. The hero of today's story is Vulcan, a noble warrior and demigod who never forgot what it means to be human. The incubation capsule with the young Primarch halted its journey in the Ultima Segmentum on the harsh planet Nocturne. In the Imperial Archives, Vulcan's homeland is designated as a feudal world of death, as adverse factors such as high levels of radiation, a deadly climate, and extreme volcanic activity stood in the way of the harmonious development of human civilization. However, even these adversities are not the main problem for the inhabitants of Nocturne. Once every 15 standard years, the orbits of the planet and its colossal moon, Prometheus, come so close to each other that the gravitational forces almost tear both celestial bodies apart. In the world's history, such periods are called times of trials. Huge tidal waves wash seas from their usual shores, thousands of volcanoes erupt simultaneously, their ash obscures the sunlight, and devastating earthquakes change the landscape beyond recognition. In the past, during regular natural catastrophes, human lives were claimed by the hundreds of thousands, and the subsequent three years of winter darkness and crop failure killed just as many. Mockingly, another calamity often joined the inevitable misfortunes of the people of Nocturne. The Dark Eldar turned the planet into their own farm for producing victims for the bloodthirsty games of the Xenos. But the most monstrous aspect of the Dark Elder raids was that the people, accustomed to constant nightmares, did not attempt to fight off the invaders. Instead, they built shelters and hideaways in their homes, quietly hiding while the Xenos abducted the most unwary. But one day, as prophesied, a saviour came to the planet. During the days of the next destructive cycle of the Times of Trials, amid skies burning with the fury of hundreds of volcanoes, a bright flash appeared, landing on the ash-covered plain. The Primarch was found by a blacksmith named Anbel. Upon first seeing the infant, the man decided that he was witnessing a miracle, a deity, or perhaps a devil, cast out in punishment for humanity's sins. The blacksmith's fears receded at the sound of the child's cry. Nabel took pity on the infant, assuming that he was suffering from injuries, as a flaming crater of molten glass had formed at the landing site, Yet the child was unharmed, untouched by the fire. Then Enbel understood that the child was not crying out of pain or fear. He simply did not want to be alone. The man took the extraordinary child, intending to raise him as his own son. Additionally, Enbel hid the capsule that brought the infant in his yard. With this action, the blacksmith sought to protect the child's peace of mind intending to reveal the truth to him on the day when the adopted son was old enough to learn it. In honour of one of the ancient gods, the man named the Infant Vulcan. He settled him in his home, taught him to wield weapons, and work in the forge. The child grew astonishingly fast, and in just three standard years he reached his full physical maturity. Young Vulcan surpassed any native of Nocturne in strength, but he also possessed outstanding intellect and wisdom. The culture of mutual aid, prevalent on the planet, and the loving father instilled in the young, Primarch his main characteristic, the ability to value the lives of the weakest. Four years after the capsule fell, and Bell finally decided to reveal Vulcan the secret of his arrival. The man felt that the evident differences between the population of the world and the mighty youth wounded his son's heart with unresolved questions. So one evening, the blacksmith led the Primarch to his hiding place. Nobel had hidden the incubation capsule not far from the forge in a specially excavated cellar, and on top, for security, 
he installed a broken anvil. Vulcan helped the aging father open the passage to the hideaway, but he did not descend and look at the evidence of his extraterrestrial origin. Contrary to Enbel's fears, the young Primarch was not concerned about the past. He considered Nocturne his home, and he loved the old man who taught him hunting and craftsmanship as a father. Everything else was inconsequential. Moreover, at the moment when the blacksmith decided to tell his son that he was born among the stars, the planet was attacked by the Drukhari, and there was no time for conversations. Nobel grabbed his son's hand and tried to take him to the shelter, but Vulcan refused to hide. He took a blacksmith's hammer in each hand and went out to meet the enemies. The inhabitants of Nocturne called the Xenos Twilight Spectres, adding mystical horror to the already dreadful creatures. But after a few blows of the hammer, Vulcan proved that the ghosts were made of flesh, which could be crushed. He fought the Drukhari with weapons, tore them apart with his bare hands and pulled out those already caught by their clutches. Seeing his fearlessness, some men, including Numbel, found the courage and also stood up to defend their own world. Vulcan alone destroyed no less than a hundred Xenos, and his heart only skipped a beat when one of the Drukhari witches nearly killed his father. The battle was hard and bloody, but the people emerged victorious and drove off the invaders for the first time. Learning of this, the inhabitants of other cities on the planet came to Vulcan, wishing to show him their respect. Seeing those in need of him, the Primarch vowed to crush any enemy, and the people of the world would never again be forced to hide. The greatest warrior did not conquer his planet. It bowed before him, not out of fear, but out of admiration and love. In honour of the victory over the Eldar, it was decided to hold a festive tournament, including competitions in strength and skill familiar to the local residents. But at the opening ceremony of the trials, a stranger appeared, remarkably standing out against the swarthy natives of Nocturne. His skin was pale but radiant, and his clothes were made of strange materials unknown in the primitive world. The strange stranger asked for permission to also participate in the competitions, promising at the same time that he would outdo all the other participants. The spectators in the crowd laughed at the bold statement. Their favourite champion, Vulcan, surpassed the stranger in height and physical strength, and therefore seemed to be the obvious winner. The stranger challenged the young son of the blacksmith, whichever of the two loses in the competition will swear eternal fidelity to the winner. The stranger's self-confidence made Vulcan smile, but he still accepted his terms. The competitions lasted eight days and nights, testing many brave men for strength and endurance, but all the attention of the spectators was focused on two godlike beings competing with each other on a completely different level. During some of the trials, the judges declared a draw between Vulcan and the stranger, as determining the winner turned out to be simply impossible. For example, in one of the competitions, the participants had to lift a heavy anvil off the ground and hold it longer than others. But the fair-skinned stranger and the blacksmith's son lifted the anvil above their heads and stood in this position without signs of fatigue for more than half a day. All subsequent stages had similar results, and by the end of the eighth day, the winner still had not been determined. To finally decide the outcome of the competition, the elders proposed to end the confrontation with a hunt for a salamander. Two participants were given 24 hours to forge themselves weapons and track down one of the deep dragons of Nocturne. The judges understood that such a task, which seemed insurmountable for anyone else, would be too easy for the powerful rivals, and therefore made a reservation. The winner would be the one who brought the salamander of larger size. Hunting for fireproof monsters from the slopes, spewing lava, was a popular pastime among local heroes, and the young son of the blacksmith Nunbel had long been famous as the luckiest hunter of deep dragons. The young man forged himself a huge war hammer, while the stranger preferred to create a sharp sword. After sunset, the participants climbed to the highest volcano on the planet, the mountain Deathfire, where, according to legend, the largest and most dangerous salamanders lived. The Primarch found his prey first and knocked off the head of the deep dragon with one blow of his hammer. However, as he was already carrying the lizard carcass down, 
An unexpected earthquake occurred, causing a lava eruption. Vulcan found himself in a precarious position. He hung over a fiery abyss, holding on to the edge of the cliff with only one hand. In the other hand, the young man held the dead reptile, proof of his victory. After several hours, Vulcan began to realize that even his superhuman strength would not allow him to hang over the lava lake forever. But unexpectedly, the stranger appeared next to him, holding a salamander of unimaginable size that he had killed. Seeing the critical situation of his opponent, the stranger without hesitation threw his prey into the lava and, using its fireproof skin as a bridge, carried Vulcan to safety. When the two participants returned, the cheering crowd declared the blacksmith's son the winner as he brought with him a huge reptile, while the stranger came with empty hands. But Vulcan silenced the crowd and knelt before the stranger, declaring that a man who values another's life above his own pride is worthy of his service. Then the stranger finally revealed his true essence and introduced himself as the Emperor of Mankind. He explained that he is the true father of Vulcan and also told about other Primarch and their common main task. The stranger's speech is amazed, yet the newly found son did not rush to swear allegiance to the Emperor. Vulcan was saddened by the thought of leaving Nocturne without his protection, but his father urged him to fulfil his duty to the many other worlds suffering from countless other horrors of the galaxy. About the Primarch's homeland, now after joining the Imperium, the father promised a peaceful future under the protection of the 18th Legion, created from the blood of Vulcan himself. The night after, the first captain of the Salamanders and former commander of the Pyre Guards, Artellus Numion, decided to make his sacrifice and prove that his fervent belief in the resurrection of the Primarch had validity. The first phase of the time of testing was beginning on the planet. The warrior used the natural disaster to stealthily leave the Legion Citadel and reach Deathfire Mountain, where the Primarch was buried. The first captain voluntarily stepped into the lava, willing to trade his life for the return of his father. His act was an act of pure faith, yet it worked. Artellus Numion's pursuing comrades encountered a weakened and disorientated warrior in the ashy desert, holding a spear of fulgurite in his hand. Against all reason, Vulcan was alive again. After being resurrected in the depths of Deathfire Mountain, the Primarch was lost and remembered almost nothing. But an unknown spirit who appeared to him in the form of an old man insisted that Vulcan use the items he had just created the thunder hammer Erdracul, and the talisman of seven hammers around the Primarch's neck. Upon meeting his sons, Lord of Drakes activated the talisman, opening a portal to the webway located on Nocturne. A squad of warriors got lost in the mysterious dimension of the Xenos and ended up on Comora, where they fought the Dark Elder. The Salamander then picked up a fleet of Shadrach Medicine, who claimed that his genetic father, Ferris Manus, had been reborn. The captain of the Iron Hands was wrong. Manus was only a demonic fake, and Vulcan had to destroy him. Retreating to Caldera, the Primarch of Salamander met again with the mysterious old man who led him to the gateway to the webway, this time transporting a squad of warriors to the world of Kalistar, where Vulcan had destroyed Nurgle's supreme demon, Aghalbor. Lord of Drakes did this with his new weapon capable of destroying servants of Chaos permanently, not just temporarily removing them from the real universe. Unlike many of the Primarch found earlier, the one who would soon be called the Lord of Drakes before agreeing to serve, asked the Emperor many questions, some of which remained unanswered. Vulcan considered himself a simple man, but not a fool and wanted to know the true intention of the one who wanted to take him away from his native home. Emperor of of Mankind happily told his son that the miraculous change in his appearance was not magic, but rather science, about his laboratory and the creation of the Primarchs. He spoke of the plan to save humanity, for which he was willing to go to any lengths. He shared a dream in which he saw the future, where people live sublime and eternal lives. Then Vulcan asked his father, Was it part of the Emperor's plan that his own sons would be cast into the void on worlds of flame, ice and death? 
the evasive answer of the Emperor demonstrated to the Primarch that some true father would never reveal to him. Vulcan understood the significant role of his brethren in the Emperor's plan, as well as what he could learn from them, powerful commanders and warriors. The Primarch considered himself a blacksmith, a creator, striving only for peace, not for war. Therefore he asked his father about the main thing, what his unique role in the Emperor's great plan is, and what he can teach the other Primarchs. The answer to this question was already known to the Emperor of Mankind, but he revealed it to Vulcan only after their first joint battle. During his first years in the service of the Emperor, the Primarch of the 18th Legion did not meet his warriors and remained close to his father under his direct tutelage. It is believed that his appearance remained a secret to all but the Primarchs already found. During this period, Vulcan was trained in the military arts, history and science, where he displayed a keen mind, as well as a rare wisdom and compassion that some felt was at odds with his destined role as a warlord and destroyer of worlds. In battle he fought alongside the Emperor as a nameless warrior in emerald armour, reminiscent of the ancient dragons of Terran legends. Primarch spent much time in the weapon forges of Mars, where he met his brother Ferus Manus, who later became one of his closest friends. The Emperor deliberately sent his two sons into battle together so that they would discover qualities in themselves and each other that they had not previously suspected. Ferus Manus, upon seeing an enemy missile fly exactly where Vulcan was, forgot about rationality and rushed to his brother through the thick of the battle. Primarch of the Tenth Legion realized he would not be able to reach and rescue in time, but kept running, possessed by a previously unfamiliar sense of caring. He found Vulcan alive. His brother had lost his helmet and much of his armor, covered in his own blood, but clutched to his chest what he had withstood a direct bomb hit for. In the palm of Primarch's hand lay a one-year-old girl, frightened but alive. Ferris was shocked by the contradiction between the Vulcan's frightening eyes and the kindness of his soul behind the devilish gaze. Primarch was willing to sacrifice himself for those who were weaker. Watching him gently cradle the child, the other warriors shared Vulcan's noble sentiments. This was exactly the role the Emperor had prepared for him. His father hoped that the Primarch of the 18th Legion would teach his warriors and brothers about mercy. It wasn't until years later when Vulcan deemed himself worthy to take charge of the fate of the 18th Legion, that he made the decision to finally meet his own sons. In his first meeting with his Astartes, Primarch gave a speech in which he told them that he understood their suffering and the pain of the warrior's plight. Vulcan promised that now the Legion's situation would change, for he was not only a lord and mentor, but also a father who would teach the newest everything he knew. The momentous meeting took place in the hour of need. Legion forces, led by Lord Commander Cassian Vaughan, were drawn into the defence of the Imperial Worlds against the Orcs in the Taurus Sector. At the time, the bulk of the Legion with the Astartes were busy fighting the horrors of Rangdan, or were on long-range expeditions and unable to respond quickly to the Orc invasion. The 18th Legion was the only one that was able to arrive on the Xenos, invaded planets and protect the population. 19,000 Astartes assisted the local inhabitants in organising defensive squads. Thus, by the efforts of the Astartes and the people, the Imperial Worlds repelled a series of continuous attacks by millions of Orcs for a year. During this time, the Astartes managed to conduct a full evacuation of the civilian population of three worlds to a relatively safe area within the system. The saving of human lives came at a high cost to the Astartes warriors, but from the sons of Vulcan, nothing else could be expected. To protect mortals, the legionnaires themselves trapped themselves on the dead world of Antem. According to the Lord Commander's plan, the planet was supposed to act as a lightning rod and distract the attention of the bloodthirsty Xenos. Region was far from the boundaries of the Great Crusade, and the doomed did not expect support from other expeditions, deciding to perish in a last attempt to protect people at the cost of their own lives. However, Vulcan learned of his son's dire situation. Barely having acquainted himself with his legion, he threw all his forces into arriving to help as quickly as possible. 
along with the Primark, 3,000 new space marines recruited from the natives of Nocturne, as well as numerous warships, combat vehicles and weapons made according to Vulcan's designs, were sent to the planet. With the new forces, the Legion descended upon the Orc invaders, destroying the largest of the space hulks orbiting Antem. Leading a squad of warriors, the Primarch infiltrated what the Orcs considered their ship and placed seismic charges at its centre. The Space Marines, inspired by the unexpected intervention of their genetic father, launched a new attack on the Xenos, ignoring the depletion of their ammunition and physical strength. The Orcs found themselves caught between the hammer and the anvil of noble fury, which in its power surpassed even their own. The Xenos left the battle and turned to flee, but Vulcan's sons caught up with them to mercilessly deliver them to fire. After the victory, the two halves of the 18th Legion met on the coral sands of the desert planet and removed their helmets to greet each other. The Terrans could not help but be amazed that Vulcan and the space marines from his home planet had a mutation that distinctly set Nocturnians apart from others. Due to the influence of high-level radiation and the constant presence of rare chemical elements in the atmosphere, the people living on Nocturne acquire an onyx skin colour regardless of their original ethnic background. In addition, the mutation affects vision, allowing Nocturnians, when necessary, to see the world in the infrared spectrum, which is very useful when the atmosphere is polluted by volcanic emissions. This feature is manifested only in the bright red iris of the eye, which glows in the dark. But despite the external differences, the Terran legionnaires immediately understood that before them stood the father who came to save them and take them home. The survivors were happy to kneel, but Vulcan ordered them to rise, saying that all his sons are equal, and he is not a petty king in need of a demonstration of obedience. Instead, the Primarch himself knelt before the Terrans in honour of the thousands of lives they had saved and the high price the warriors paid for it. Then Vulcan found the fatally wounded Lord Commander Cashin Vaughan and formally handed over command of the Legion to him giving the dying warrior the broken power claw with which he was struck. With this gesture, the Primarch sealed the pact between the two halves of the army, showing they are brothers who will forever fight for each other. After their first full battle, Vulcan set about reshaping his legion, seeking to preserve established notions of honour, self-sacrifice and bravery. Before meeting their genetic father, the 18th Legion had no name of their own, only a numerical designation. However, the soldiers of the Imperial Army, who were fortunate enough to fight alongside Vulcan's sons, dubbed them the The Fearless Legion. The Primarch, however, bestowed upon the warriors the name Salamanders, in honour of the most dangerous lizards on his native planet. Ancient, fierce creatures, whose blood was fire and whose emerald skin was considered as impenetrable as steel, held totemic significance for the inhabitants of Nocturne. But the Primarch chose this name not because of the reptile's lethality. The name Salamanders carries a deeper meaning. Predatory lizards are always dangerous. But the inhabitants of the Primarch's native planet know that when salamanders protect their pack or offspring, defeating them is nearly impossible. Nothing can make a deep dragon fight fiercer than the desire to preserve the lives of others. The Legion's emblem became the skull of Kasari the lizard defeated by Vulcan during a competition with the Emperor. It was the lizard's emerald skin that the Primarch placed on his armour as a frightening yet magnificent cloak. Vulcan's emerald armour could withstand the heaviest blow, including direct nuclear bombardment. His warhammer, the Dawnbringer, was capable of breaking any defence, had a built-in teleporter, and due to its incredible weight, could only be wielded by the Primarch Salamander himself. Vulcan brought his entire legion back to his homeworld, where he augmented existing strengths and added new ones. On Nocturne, his companions built powerful fortresses, arsenals and manufacturums. Modest huts gave way to agglomerations of residential domes, relay stations and vox towers, and instead of earth magicians and metal workers, seismologists and geologists appeared. Additionally, a special Astartes garrison was stationed on the planet, whose only task was to protect the population from possible Dark Eldar attacks. The lives of the people changed for the better. 
Vulcan took the best from the Imperium and gave it to his people while still preserving the unique culture of Nocturne. The Primarch managed to unite the ideas of the ruler of humanity with the ancient beliefs of his native planet, which entered history under the name Promethean Cult. Vulcan did this so wisely that neither the Emperor nor the Inquisition found anything contrary to the true elements of Nocturne's teaching, although many cruel traditions could rightly be called barbaric. The most common ritual of the Salamanders is branding, performed before and after battles. The teachings of Prometheus do not imply belief in gods or other supernatural beings, but they carry the idea of the endless cycle of rebirth of one soul in a new body. The cult in which the Primarch grew up did not become a stumbling block even among the Space Marines. Vulcan demonstrated his respect for Terran warriors and highly valued their merits in all spheres. The Primarch presented all innovations not as replacements, but as transformations into something new while remaining faithful to the past. Moreover, the first Space Marines to be incorporated into the Pyre Guard, the elite core of Vulcan's bodyguards, were also seven of the fiercest Terran natives. For the fallen Lord Commander Cassian Vaughan, the Primarch personally created a unique sarcophagus dreadnought, the Iron Dragon, so that the honorary warrior could serve as the guardian and protector of the renewed legion. When, after years of preparation, the Salamanders rejoined the Great Crusade, they were tempered and forged into a unified, efficient force, whose name soon became a guarantee of successful completion of assigned operations. Vulcan imparted wisdom and focus to his warriors, but most importantly, he gave them purpose, an idea against which the endless war gained meaning. Many Astartes of other legions and even their Primarchs often displayed disdain for mortals, which, in dark times for the galaxy, led to a schism where demigods directly opposed themselves to humans, not understanding them and deeming them unworthy of ruling the Imperium. The reasons for this are understandable. The majority of Astartes are taken from their families at a young age and, upon elevation into the Astartes, usually have no recollection of what it means to be human. But Vulcan acted differently. He established a tradition whereby the warriors of the 18th Legion do not sever ties with their biological families. The Primarch himself, as long as the short span of human life allowed, visited his foster father and Bell and his old home. Because the Salamanders have closer ties with the people of their native world than any other Astartes Legion and interact with their families throughout their lives, they are inclined to show concern for the fates of other mortal subjects of the Emperor and strive with all their might to prevent casualties among the civilian population. Even after thousands of years, the descendants of the 18th Legion remain faithful to their traditions and do not allow themselves to become estranged from humanity. Typically during times free from war, the Salamanders live together with their families on Nocturne and Prometheus, where they often serve as leaders of settlements. During distant missions, fighting for the happy future of humanity, Vulcan's sons could remember specific people, friends and loved ones, for whose well-being it was worth venturing to the edge of the galaxy and sacrificing themselves. It was now said of the Salamanders that they were neither quick to anger nor prone to rush in blindly to battle as once they had been. But once they had decided to unleash their wrath, it was as unstoppable and terrifying as the volcanic fury of the Dark World they now called home. Within the Great Crusade, the Salamanders proved themselves to be a highly effective force, integrating well with the ranks of the Imperial Army. One notable campaign of the Legion was the pacification of the Ibsen world, where the sons of Vulcan intervened with the support of the Iron Hands and the Death Guard. The world was untamed and largely inhospitable, but it possessed valuable deposits of useful minerals. However, Imperial forces encountered fierce resistance from the Eldar inhabitants of the planet. The Xenos couldn't hope for victory even against one Astartes legion, yet on Ibsen there were three, each led by its own Primarch. Nevertheless, the Eldar continued to fight proudly, and soon human tribes from the world joined them. Vulcan was surprised by the fact that humans were capable of sympathising and even aiding creatures that had tormented his native planet for centuries. But even more shocking 
were the episodes in which Xenos tried to protect armed with sticks and stones humans from the space marines. When issuing orders, the Primarch was unaware that civilians were present in the combat zone. His soul was torn apart by the realization that he had killed hundreds of men, women, and even children. He had done to the inhabitants of Ibsen what the Eldar had done to his people. And the people, fearing the Space Marines rather than the Xenos, were absolutely right. After the victory, Vulcan removed his helmet, wanting to show the survivors that the Emperor's wars were not fought by monsters. However, the horror on the faces of mortals spoke otherwise. The Primarch could come to terms with the deaths of warriors, living under constant threat was their choice, but the death of ordinary people should not have occurred. But to prevent the spread of Xenos worship further, the Primarch was forced to issue orders to burn down the entire population of Ibsen along with the Elder and humans. The Primarch understood that all his actions were reasonable. The Imperial commander had no other choice. The dead world was renamed Caldera and settled by new colonists. But from that day on, the struggle between duty and righteousness, as well as the oppressive guilt for his deeds, never left Vulcan. Deep down, he hoped that someday after the end of the Great War, he could return to his homeland to live the life of an ordinary farmer. For a hammer is not only a weapon, but also a tool of creation. To the formidable Lord of Drakes, these dreams did not seem strange or unattainable, as he sincerely believed that his brothers would desire such a peaceful fate. Soon after the campaign on Ibsen was completed, the Salamander's Legion participated in bringing peace to Kara Utten. The planet was also visited by Conrad Kurz's Night Lord, the Titans of Legio Ignis, and several regiments of the Imperial Army. The two Primarchs had opposing views on the methods of warfare, which quickly escalated into a confrontation that nearly ended in fratricide. Night Haunter could not understand Vulcan's love for mortals, he was astonished that his brother not only valued the lives of mere mortals, but also made distinctions among them, valuing some more than others. Conrad Kurz found such behaviour utterly foreign. He despised all mortals equally, and therefore couldn't answer even the simplest questions about human relationships. Instead, the Primarch Night Haunter decided to demonstrate the similarities between himself and his brother by choosing the only method he knew. Torture by order of Conrad Kurz, the population of one of Karatan's largest cities was completely annihilated. In this manner, the Primarch planned, in his characteristic way, to sow terror in the hearts of the planet's inhabitants, as fear seemed to him the most effective tool of warfare. Upon learning of the crime against humanity, Vulcan was filled with rage, but his reaction was also part of Night Haunter's plan. Conrad Kurz wanted to provoke the noble brother, to force him to commit an act that would confirm that there was much more in common between them than the Salamander Primarch would care to admit. The senseless deaths of millions of people horrified Vulcan. He grabbed his warhammer and almost attacked Kurz, but the flames over the destroyed city reminded him of what had happened on Ibsen. The Primarchs all had different life views and acted in different ways, but each mission had resulted in loss of life in one way or another. Vulcan blamed himself for what had happened, but what was even scarier was that he didn't know how many more worlds he would have to burn before it was all over. In front of Kurz, enraged by the death of his summoners, the Lord of Drakes destroyed an elder warrior already defeated and kneeling. Like most Drukhari witches, she looked young and beautiful while remaining a ruthless killer. However, Conrad Kurz made sure that Vulcan misled by the Elder Maiden's deceptive appearance, was convinced that he had burned the child. Angry at himself, provoked by his brother, the Lord of Drakes plunged Conrad Kurz to the ground, intending to strangle him. No resistance was forthcoming. On the contrary, Night Haunter rejoiced at the opportunity to prove to Vulcan that he was just as much a murderer as the rest of the Primarchs. Having finished ghosting the planet to agreement, Father Salamanders spoke about the behaviour of Conrad Kerr's Rogel Dawn as well as Horace Lupercal, whom he considered his closest friend. What happened on Karatan was the beginning of a years-long feud between Vulcan and Night Haunter. After Night Haunter's treachery became known, the Emperor ordered seven full legions of Space Marines to attack the treacherous forces in the Istvan system. 
Vulcan felt that Horus, whatever his reasons, would be the loser and regret his downfall. The Primarch of the Salamanders was unaware that by then four of the seven legions the Emperor had sent had already turned their backs on his light. Immediately after the first landing craft pierced the cloud layer, the batteries of traitorous guns above Istvan V filled the skies with fire. This hardly hindered the offensive. At least 40,000 loyalist Astartes landed on the planet, but almost every landing craft arrived on the surface damaged, and many were destroyed while still in the air. The 10th Ferris Manus Legion attacked the centre of the traitorous army. The Raven Guard took the left flank and the Salamanders the right flank. The sons of Vulcan acted with clarity and purpose. There were so many of them that it might have seemed as if the black sands of Istvan had overwhelmed the Emerald Sea. The Primarch marched in the vanguard of his legion, accompanied by funeral guards, two battalions of Terminators, and several dreadnought that shook everything around them with shots from their autocannons. In the landing zone, Vulcan had to fight Death Guard units that had served as his allies during the tragic operation on Ibsen. The Primarch's armour was invulnerable to the endless streams of bolter fire, but by that day the Sons of Mortarion already possessed weapons of more insidious power. Before Vulcan's eyes, the 15th Reconnaissance Company was killed by a previously unknown poisonous gas. Aware of the impending danger, the Death Guards wore protective respirators, while the Salamander Space Marines continued to fight unencumbered by helmets. Over a hundred warriors of the 15th Company fell, choking on their own blood, their bodies reduced to an unrecognizable, monstrous mass in tattered armor. The Death Guard gained a numerical advantage over the surviving portion of the Scouting Company and were about to surround the remnants of the Salamanders, but Vulcan single-handedly prevented this, furiously slaying one son of Mortarion after another. Soon the Lord of Drakes was joined by his funeral guard, and the confrontation turned into a bloody melee. The battlefield was soaked with blood, and even the mist above it was coloured red. It was then that Vulcan heard a voice frantically shouting his name. The Primarch was being summoned by his brother and Lord of the Twelfth Legion, Angron. Thirty World Eaters attacked a group of Salamander Space Marines outnumbered by more than four to one. The maddened Legionnaires of the Twelfth favoured close combat, and so some of them were killed by bolter fire before reaching the Loyalist position. But those who could march continued the attack, despite their wounds. It was rumoured that the sons of Angron were like their genetic father, and had implants implanted in their skulls to fuel their rage. At the Battle of Istvan V, the Salamanders believed these stories to be true. While the rank-and-file warriors fought a bloody melee and Vulcan Terminators confronted Angron's bodyguards, the Primarchs were about to engage the two brothers in a monstrous duel. The Butcher's Nail's Red Angel was to meet the Dawnbringer, the Warhammer Lord of Drakes, but before the demigods could clash, a rocket salvo split the sky, followed by a firestorm between the brothers. The space marines closest to the Primarchs died, and even those in Terminator armor were reduced to ash. The surviving salamanders surrounded the genetic father, wanting to protect him from the lost but still ferocious World Eaters. The Astartes of the 18th Legion were battered, but would not stop until they were dead. In spite of his own embarrassment, Vulcan was relieved to hear that Allied reinforcements were approaching them. Thousands of landing modules appeared in the sky, bearing the heraldry of the Alpha Legion, the Iron Warriors, the Word Bearers, and the Lords of Night. Vulcan ordered a retreat so that the arriving Legionnaires could get their share of glory in the battle against the traitors. Angron, on the other hand, disappeared without a trace following the firestorm. The Raven Guard and Salamanders returned to the landing zone, but Ferris Manus refused to do the same. Many years later, Vulcan would blame himself for failing to dissuade his irascible brother from pursuing the traitors. The Salamanders had set up camp on the north side, and the newly arrived Iron Warriors had settled in beside them. As was the custom of the Fourth Legion, they immediately set about fortifying their position. Armoured bastions of landing craft rose first, and huge cannons appeared on the slope behind them. Just behind the line of heavy tanks, thousands of iron warriors lined up, looking as lifeless and cold as the weapons in their hands. They showed the Allies complete indifference, 
and did not respond in any way to the salamander's greeting. This raised a question, the answer to which Vulcan read in the eyes of his brother Perturabo. The Iron Warriors had betrayed them. Bloodied and tired after their battle with the Death Guard and the World Eaters, the Salamanders had gained not allies, but new enemies who had turned ten thousand guns against them. But no blade or shot could wound Vulcan more than the betrayal of his brothers had done. Enraged, the Primarch rushed towards the Iron Lord's forces so fast that the Pyre Guard fell hopelessly behind. Both sides lost hundreds of Astartes, who fell in the crossfire in the first seconds after the deception was revealed, but despite significant damage, the Salamanders stubbornly continued the offensive. Vulcan, ordered not to retreat even when threatened with death, nearly became the end of the 18th Legion. As the forces loyal to the Emperor marched up to the Iron Warriors' positions, Perturabo launched a missile the trail of which most closely resembled a huge, fiery horseshoe. The burning arc of flame rose into the sky and collapsed back to the ground, tearing apart anyone unlucky enough to be in the impact zone. Like empty armour, stripped of bone and flesh, thousands of warriors were tossed into the blazing air. Salamander tanks were reduced to tattered pieces of metal with the remains of their crews burned alive. Legionnaires, who survived the wave of crushing fire, were gutted by the shrapnel storm. A gigantic crater formed on the surface, its slopes strewn with the burnt-out war machines and the remains of Vulcan's sons. The electromagnetic pulse destroyed the Vox link, cutting off the possibility of tactical organization. The survivor's only viable strategy was to return to the landing site. Perturabo defeated the salamanders as easily as if they were not the legion but a glass cup. Contrary to the heroic defence on Istvan V, the Space Marines loyal to the Emperor were almost completely annihilated. With the death of Ferus Manus at the hands of Fulgrim, the Iron Hands, Raven Guard and Salamanders were unable to continue their combat missions and left the planet. In the immediate aftermath of the battle, few witnesses claimed that Vulcan was badly wounded and evacuated to a ship, his pyre guards. But the actual fate of the Salamander Primarch turned out to be far worse. Unlike most of his sons, Lord of Drakes survived Perturabo's missile strike and continued to fight the Iron Warriors and Night Lords around him. Vulcan resigned himself to the fact that he would die, but wanted to take as many traitors with him as possible. The Primarch fought desperately, but was still overwhelmed by the number of attackers and eventually passed out from too many wounds. He did not die. Conrad Kurz arose nearby, unable to miss the opportunity to once again torment the brother he hated and did not understand. Upon regaining consciousness, Vulcan found himself shackled in massive chains and aboard the Night Lord's ship. Over the next few months, Conrad Kurz tested the full extent of his sadistic potential on his brother, wanting to break the Lord of Drakes's body and mind and then take his life. However, the task proved impossible. Every time Conrad Kurz thought he had succeeded in killing Vulcan, the mutilated body would regenerate to its former healthy state in an unknown way. It turned out that the Salamander Primarch was an Eternal, a being capable of continuous cellular regeneration. This property made Vulcan virtually immortal just like his father, the Emperor of Mankind. In a rage, Conrad Kurz decided to kill his brother as many times as it took, to rid himself of his unbearable presence forever. Night Haunter decapitated Vulcan, ripped out his throat, and pierced his chest with his claws, but none of this produced a satisfactory result. Conrad Kurz then ordered the Space Marines to shoot Lord of Drakes with hundreds of bolters, disembowel him, place him in the engine turbine of a spaceship, strip him naked, and throw him into outer space. But each time, Vulcan stubbornly came back to life, driving his distraught brother into an even greater rage. Resigned to the fact that killing a physical shell was impossible, Night Haunter decided to break the spirit of Primarch Salamander, making him believe that he was no less a monster than Conrad Kurz himself. Vulcan had to go through trials that did not include a positive outcome. Although Lord of Drakes tried to endure the torment steadfastly, his mind could not escape the damage. In his most terrifying moments, Vulcan was visited by the distorted image of Ferus Manus, who had been a close friend in the past. 
Primarch Salamander realized that he was not seeing the real Gorgon, as the figment of his mind was far more evil and looked more like Conrad Kerr's, but guilt over his brother's death on Istvan V kept the eye-deprived dead man from disappearing. At Night Haunter's request, Perturabo built a special room, a huge trap, with innocent men, women and even children imprisoned at one end while at the other end was Primarch Salamander holding a block of stone over the heads of mortals with his own hands. Perturabo made no mistakes in his ingenious inventions. Everything was calculated perfectly. The Vulcan was able to hold the weight for exactly as long as it took for the humans to realize what was happening and wound the soul of the merciful Primarch with their screams. Despite the pain and willingness to sacrifice himself, the Lord of Drakes failed to hold the chains, turning the innocents into a bloody mass. The next torture was even more sophisticated. Conrad Kurz starved and thirsted his brother for a long time and then put him at a feast table with many dishes and drinks. The weakened Primarch was chained to a chair so that he could suffer further, unable to reach the food. However, that was not the main part of the ordeal. In addition to Vulcan, there were mortals at the table whose appearance made it clear that they too were victims of starvation torture. Their hands had been severed, and at the ends of their burnt stumps were knives and forks. Some of the men had managed to pick up bits of food even in this condition. However, the cutlery had been deliberately made too long, and getting the food to their mouths remained impossible. From the last of his strength, Vulcan shouted the only solution to the men. The Primarch urged them to feed each other but Conrad Kurz wanted his brother to watch his valued mortals die of their own greed, and so had the foresight to deprive the victims of hearing and sight, and consequently the ability to interact. The shackled Primarch Salamander spent weeks beside the slowly dying humans. Only after the last man was dead did Night Haunter appear to his brother and kill him, this time with a table fork. Perturabo's new invention was another instrument of pain. Vulcan was placed in a special battle sarcophagus covered with spikes and blades on the inside and outside. The Primarch could not control his body, finding himself a living puppet imprisoned in a death machine. In this way, Conrad Kurz forced his brother to become the unwilling killer of several Imperial Army soldiers and veterans of the Raven Guard. The Space Marines managed to damage one of the war machine's limbs, and when a salamander legionnaire stepped in front of Vulcan, the Primarch was able to kill himself with a sword attached to his own arm. The torture of body and mind was not as meaningful to Night Haunter as the desire to prove to his brother. He is a monster who is no better than Conrad Kurz himself. With the help of several Psyker priests, the Primarch of the Lord of Night compelled Vulcan into an illusion in which Corvus Corax had to be killed to gain his freedom. Knowing the nobility of the Lord of Drakes, Conrad Kurz declared that if his brother gave in and allowed himself to be killed, he would see Corvus Corax suffering terrible torture upon resurrection. But even these words could not compel Vulcan to strike Corax a fatal blow. The illusion shattered and embittered by the failure, Conrad Kurz killed his brother again. The solution was another ingenious and sinister construction by the Iron Lord, a fantastic labyrinth created in defiance of physical laws. In the centre, Conrad Kurz placed the Dawnbringer, Vulcan's Warhammer, as well as two dying Salamander space marines. The elaborate prison was constructed in such a way that any mental mapping of corridors or attempt to memorize directions was rendered meaningless once the Primarch had taken a few steps inside the labyrinth. On top of that, while Vulcan was trying to plot a route to his dying sons, Conrad Kurz repeatedly attacked him from the darkness, stabbing but not killing him. At the Salamander Primarch's worst moment, the Emperor appeared to him, temporarily taking on the guise of a mortal summoner. The Emperor of Mankind reminded his son that he was watching over him, calmed Vulcan's fractured mind, and gave him fresh strength. The Lord of Drakes then saw an opportunity for salvation in Conrad Kurz himself. He began to bully his brother, calling him a frightened child and the weakest Primarch. The distraught Night Haunter himself opened the way to the centre of the labyrinth, where Dawnbringer was resting under an energy shield. The salamander warriors chained to the walls were dead 
but Vulcan overcame his sadness, realising that killing his sons was just a way of pissing him off. Conrad Kurz, on the other hand, possessed no such rationality. The Lord of Drakes had told his brother that all the other Primarchs felt pity for him, and he himself had always held back his strength for fear of breaking Conrad Kurz while sparring in the training cages. Those words alone were enough for Night Haunter to throw back his blade in anger and attempt to engage Vulcan in hand-to-hand -hand combat. The Primarch, Salamander, defeated Conrad Kurz with ease and then used his body as a hammer to break the energy shield over Dawnbringer. As in the past, Lord of Drakes chose not to kill his brother. Vulcan believed that the Emperor had invested all of his incredible intellect into creating sons that he intended to surpass humans. Thanks to the Emperor of Mankind's incomparable knowledge, the Primarchs reached heights that mortals could not even conceive of. But along with improved virtues, some of the Emperor's sons had acquired vices beyond those that lived in the hearts of the worst of men. Vulcan pitied Conrad Kurz, considering him the most flawed, but did not kill him because he could not take his own brother's life. Reaching for his hammer, Primarch Salamander activated the teleporter built into it and travelled to the upper atmosphere of Makrag, the capital of the Kingdom of Ultramar. As the Primarch flew towards the surface, his body burned up. But before he died once again, Vulcan had time to rejoice that this time he would be resurrected in the domain of Raboot Gilliman. Later, Conrad Kurz, who had escaped from the Dark Angel's flagship, travelled to Makrag, wanting to finish what he had started and finally kill Vulcan, but was stopped by the other Primarchs. However, the Lord of Drakes still died. It is generally believed that he was struck down by John Grammaticus, an Eternal who was a representative of the mysterious Cabal organization. The weapon used was the Spear of Fulgurite, a special material formed by an underground surface in the distant past when the Emperor released his infinite power during a battle with the Chaos Gods. Fulgurite is supposedly the only substance in the galaxy capable of irrevocably killing an Eternal. The Imperium Secundus became a haven for many surviving legionnaires of the 18th. Lost, but still willing to serve the Emperor of Mankind, the warriors could find no better use for themselves than to move to the realm of Raboot Gilliman. While the Salamanders, convinced of their Primarch's death, mourned their loss, the Ultramarines held a lavish funeral ceremony for Lord of Drakes. Vulcan was buried in a golden tomb, wearing his armour and placing a warhammer in his dead hands. The Spear of Fulgurite remained in the Primarch's chest, as no one was able to remove it. The Ultramarines assumed they had given him a proper funeral, but the cold golden sarcophagus was a far cry from the funerary rituals of the Prometheus cult. Led by their first captain, Artellus Numion, the surviving salamanders convinced the ruling Imperium Secundus Primarchs to allow them to attempt to transfer Vulcan's body to his home planet. The warriors had not given up hope that Lord of Drakes might have risen once more. There was a reason for their belief. On its way to Macrag, the ship had become lost in the warp and might have disappeared forever had it not been for the intervention of Magnus the Red's soul shard. Guided by unknown reasons, which the first salamander captain explained as a gesture of brotherly affection for Vulcan, Magnus the Red took the ship to the capital of Ultramar and planted in the warrior's mind the idea that the Lord of Drakes would be resurrected if a meaningful sacrifice was made for it. To accomplish the mission, the Astartes of the 18th Legion had to overcome Ruinstorm, fight a fleet of word-bearers and the Death Guard, and then defend Nocturne in battle against the forces of the traitors. When the enemies were defeated, the Space Marines performed a proper funeral ceremony during which the Primarch's body was lowered into the lava. But no miracle occurred. The Vulcan did not revive. But despite this, the small band of salamanders could not stand up to the huge number of enemies for long. They only managed to escape thanks to the intervention of a mysterious old man who finally revealed that he was an Eldar seer, Eldred Ulthran. The entrance to the webway beneath the Emperor's abode was sealed by his will, and so Eldred Ulthran opened a new portal to terror for the Vulcan. 
The salamanders moved to the palace gates, where Rogel Dawn stepped out to meet them. The Lord of Drakes was happy to see one of his brothers and even hugged Dawn, realizing that the reserved Primarch would never show that he was happy to see him either. The Emperor of Mankind revealed to Vulcan that he had guided him in the creation of the Udracula and the Seven Hammers Talisman. This particular artifact was a crucial element of immense power, capable of destroying the throne world should Horus prevail. By the hands of his son, the Emperor had created the Doomsday Weapon, and Vulcan was to be the one to activate it, should the need arise. Lord of Drakes installed the Seven Hammers Talisman into the Golden Throne and froze at the Eternity Gate, awaiting the final battle for Terra. The events that happened to the 18th Legion just after the end of the Great Heresy are murky and perhaps only revealed to the silent librarians of the Salamanders. It is known, however, that when Robuta Gilliman wrote the Codex Astartes and decreed that the forces be reformed by dividing the legions into orders of no more than a thousand space marines, Vulcan sided with the brothers, who did not support the Ultramarines Primarch's idea. Yet, like the others, Lord of Drakes eventually came to terms with the innovation, believing that even the integrity of the legion was not worth putting the Imperium in danger again. The fact that the Salamanders were so depleted by the events on Istvan for Fifth that they were barely enough for even a single order also played a significant role in his decision. The final fate of the Vulcan is a subject of much debate. The Vulcan did not revive. According to some sources, the Primarch led his order for 3,000 years after the Horus heresy before travelling into unknown space with a task he never announced to anyone. This story is made even more mysterious by the fact that before his disappearance, Vulcan left his sons the Tome of Fire, within which he encrypted the location of nine artefacts. The text states that a thousand years after the events of the heresy, the Lord of Drakes hid nine relics throughout the galaxy which he bequeathed to his sons. According to the Tome of Fire, after the Salamanders track down all the items, Vulcan will deem them worthy and return from his long-distance mission back to Nocturne. By the 41st millennium, five relics are known. Three of them, including Kasari's mantle, are kept in the Primarch's homeland. The other two are held by the Master of the Order in the fortress on Prometheus. The remaining four have yet to be discovered. And who knows how long it will take for the Order of Salamanders to return to humanity its most merciful protector.